Aida Richardson uh, in English and Aida Montalvo Rosado de Richardson in Espanol. <laughs> and uh, I was born in San Turce, Puerto Rico uh, in 1950. My name is Ben Gallegos. I was born in Romeo, Colorado on May 11th, 1939. Thank you. Can you tell me what you know about your cultural heritage? Maybe where your ancestors came from? Well, to the best of my knowledge, my uh, ancestors uh, were in northern New Mexico and southern Colorado uh, several uh, a hundred years or so before I was born. Uh, they came early with the very, very first settlers into the, to the region, uh, right around right after Coronado. And uh, so uh, I'm in the process right now of talking to other uh, cousins and relatives of mine who are in the process of trying to get a family tree going, so we're going to go back to see how far we can trace that. But to the best of our knowledge, uh, our ancestors came from Spain, uh, but I'm sure that there's probably a little Indian blood mixed in all of us, uh, because there's mostly men that came early. Uh, but uh, we, our ancestry is from Spain. Buenos dias, Jose Alvarado. ¿Cómo estás? Muy bien, Jose Barrera. Muy bien. ¿Y usted? Sí, bueno. Yo también estoy bien, Jose Alvarado. We're here today talking to uh, Mr. Jose Alvarado, a longtime resident of Colorado Springs West Side, the owner of the Health Matrix, uh, a health club and gym on the West Side. Jose, were you born in Colorado Springs? No, I came here when I was about six, five, six years old. I see. Where did you come from? San Luis Potosí. San Luis Potosí, which is in? That's the city where... Santa Ana put together 5,000 5, men to come to defend the Alamo. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. So that's in Mexico then? Yeah. That's down south of uh, Monterrey in, yeah. uh, in uh, the eastern side of, yes. of the Mexican Republic. Yeah, it's about 750 miles south of San Antonio or Laredo. Uh, my name is Leanne Helen Baca Bartlett. I was born in uh, 1972 in Salem, Oregon although I'm told that I was conceived at the Broadmoor <laughs> in Colorado Springs. <laughs> Can you tell me about your cultural heritage, where your ancestors came from? Um, on my mother's side, uh, my family is, is from uh, northern New Mexico, San Luis Valley, uh, m part, of the, part of a wave of settlers coming from, from Spain, also mixing with indigenous people. And um, on my father's side, I am Dutch and French and coming from a long way of, of people who came uh, about the same time as the Mayflower, coming to Plymouth Rock and then settling on the East Coast. My full name is George Perez Guerrero. I was born in West Laco, Texas, which is down in the Rio Grande Valley uh, tip of Texas okay. in 1947. Okay. Can you tell me about your cultural heritage, maybe where your grandparents came from, your background? Uh, as far as my her heritage is uh, concerned, uh, both sets of grandparents on both my mother and my father's side are from Mexico. Uh, my mother is actually uh, a Mexican citizen, or was a Mexican citizen. She was born in Mexico. My dad was born in the same little town that I was, uh, and then my grandfather went back to Mexico. Uh, they both each come from a family of 15 children. 
Uh, my dad is the oldest, my mom is the youngest, and so uh, I am bilingual. We had to learn Spanish as children in order to get along with all our aunts and uncles and our grandparents when we went to visit uh, across the border in Mexico. I was born in Colorado Springs on uh, July the 31st, 1933. That's how I got my name. The 31st of July is St. Ignatius Day. My parents, being Catholic, named me Ignaz Ignacio. Where did your parents come from? My father came to this country from uh, Aguascalientes through California and eventually ended up here in Colorado Springs. And my mother came from a place called Guanajuato in the state of Guanajuato in Mexico. My name is uh, Bonnie Lopez. Uh, Bonnie is short for Bonifacio Lopez. I was born in uh, San Isidro, Colorado. That's a little community uh, east, about three miles east of Antonito. And Antonito is about 30 miles south of Alamosa in the San Luis Valley. I was born there June the 2nd, 1931. That was a long time ago. <laughs> uh, my name is Eddie Lopez, and I was born in San Antonio, Colorado, and that's about three miles uh, south of, uh, of Antonito, uh, almost on the New Mexico borderline. I'm uh, Juanita Natalie Martinez, and I was born in Lahana, Colorado, and I ran by my middle name, Natalie, for years. and. Uh, didn't start using my name Juanita until I started working. My name is Bernie Martinez and I was born in Crestview, Colorado. Yes, uh, my name is Gene Sanchez. I was born in uh, the San Luis Valley uh, in Alamosa, Colorado. Uh, I was born May 24th of 1958. It's a cultural heritage which I think is uh, very rich and it's uh, one that uh, I treasure sharing with uh, Colorado and with the country and I also believe that it's important for everybody to know their history and know their heritage uh, regardless of their background, regardless of whether they are German or Irish or African American, that the history is something that's very important because it tells us who we are as people and how we've come together as a nation. You know, in my own case, my uh, family uh, helped settle the city of Santa Fe, New Mexico back in 1598. They uh, lived and uh, farmed the areas uh, in Santa Fe and north of Santa Fe along the Rio Grande and its tributaries near Chamita for 250 years. And then uh, following the Mexican-American War, they moved from uh, New Mexico into the San Luis Valley and became uh, one of the first uh, uh, families to settle the southern part of Colorado. Si vas a hablar en inglés, salte tu pa' fuera y ahí hablas inglés. Pero en esta casa no. What I was told is that if you're going to talk in English, you do it outside, not in here. That's what I was told. So we were brought up with making sure that we clearly understood who we were. Not a disrespect for anybody else, but the fact is, is you've got to know exactly who you are. And part of who you are is your language. And how they said it, maybe it was a little stern, but the fact is, is that you learn your language, know who you are. If you want to talk English, you go do it outside. I never spoke a word of, of, uh, of English to my father, never, not even one. To my mother, I would speak to her in, in English to make her mad, you know, she'd be outside. <laughs> I said, hi lady, how are you doing? And then she'd answer me, you know, real mad, you know. <laughs> but you had too much respect for your father, you'd never do that for him. No, you know, no, the serious. It's, it's a difficult subject because my mother, it was her first language, but when she was out in a country schoolhouse in Greeley, she started school at first grade, but, but she, I mean, there, there was a physical threat for her to speak Spanish in school. I mean, she was threatened and, um, and she didn't speak English when she first started school and was looked down upon for that because they, they uh, the teachers assumed that she was dumb and, and not intelligent. And I know that that's still, um, affects her. It's part of the reason that she became a teacher because she wanted to help other kids feel accepted in school and she finally did come in contact with a teacher that that 
recognized her abilities and um, and recognized the the learning curve that she had because she didn't have the English right away when she came to school at first. And the other, the, the other thing that's interesting is that uh, we all spoke Spanish. You know, our our ancestors came were here before the pilgrims. Yet uh, uh, yet we lived in a in a community that, that uh, very few people spoke English. I didn't learn to speak English till I was in about third grade or something like that. And and we were required to speak English, but our teachers spoke Spanish and, and they taught in English and uh, and we, we had we did the best we could with our second language was, was English. Like My first it? language was Spanish. And back then when you went to school you went to first grade. You, there was no kindergarten. So when we went to first grade, I had three older sisters. I'm the youngest in the family. So they were all learning English. So I picked up on the English when I started school because at home you basically spoke Spanish. And I was raised very much in the culture. I came from a Hispanic neighborhood that was mixed with Mexican culture. And so when we went to school in Lahana, there was a definite racial prejudice. We had a, the Spanish and Mexican cultural Catholic Church, and you had your Anglo-Saxon, gringo, however you would like to pronounce it, Catholic Church. So we were separate, but yet back then, which was in the 50s, 40s, and 50s, we knew we knew it was there, but it never bothered us because we we felt that our our little which you might say neighborhood that we were in was very comfortable for us. So we didn't look at it the way society looks at it today. At that time, <clears throat> do you think that there was uh, you know racial segregation in Colorado Springs? You know, so you were a Mexican, you couldn't pretty you had pretty much had to stay there in that area. You couldn't live anywhere else. Oh, you couldn't live anywhere else. Oh, buy, maybe. You know, you couldn't buy. You couldn't buy. Just anywhere. They had it in the courthouse that had designated with uh, little red pins where you could buy, where you couldn't buy. See? Is that right? At the yeah. courthouse? Yeah, at the courthouse. I didn't know that. Yeah. Have you seen and, a map like that or something? Yeah, I saw it there because I went there, you know, because I could speak English and Spanish. So when I went to buy that piece of land on South El Paso, 700 South El Paso. Right. Then they brought out a big map, you know. And they brought out book, a big map to, had, to see yeah. if you were buying where you could buy. Yeah. Uh -huh. And what did they say? And uh, so I found a piece of land that used to belong to the uh, Santa Fe Railroad when we went through there. Right. So we got that block there, you know. And what did they say down. when you went <clears throat> to the courthouse, though, when you were trying to buy the land? Well, they just were frank, you know, said so Mexicans can't buy here, you know. But you can buy over here and so forth, see? I so see. you kind of, kind of, uh, you know, weather it, you know, went along with it, you know, because there wasn't a whole lot you could do, you know. Uh -huh. Those was only about, I could count the, the actual Mexican people in my hand, you know. There was about 15 to 20 families. But my mom didn't have any problem getting along in English because uh, as I was growing up, she could understand, she'd go to the grocery stores, and she could understand what they were saying back to her when she asked how much is this and how much here and how much that she knew. And she knew the money and how to um, count that out. But the other part uh, was just a source of such great embarrassment to me that uh, I don't know how I ever went through it. Because anytime we headed any place, she, she went to the grocery store or to Cress's or Penny's downtown. There was always, vamonos si nacio. She'd grab me by the hand and away we'd go. And so we'd stand there at the counter and she'd say, pregúntale como cuesta, cuánto cuesta esto. So I'd turn to the guy and say, she wants to know how much this is. And he'd say, that's about a dollar and a half. And then I'd look to her and say, un, un dólar y veinticinco centavos. And all this translating thing back and forth, it was so humili humiliating me, to me. But you know, I look back now and realize that that is where God wanted me and it was a blessing because it taught me English and it taught me translations because after all these years, you know, I finally graduated from uh, 
uh, Memphis State University with a degree in Spanish. Now my mother was a major influence in my life also and uh, because we really learned to love and respect her because she was working so hard to take care of all of us because she was doing stuff that a lot of men weren't doing. And, uh, and at the same time, she was a very loving, caring person and everybody just loved her dearly for the kind of person she was. So me and my brothers all just learned to, even as adults, we still talk about her even though she died when she was 54 years old, what a great woman she was. And that has actually shaped my attitude towards women. Uh, I have always had the deepest regard and respect for women in all areas of life and I know it's because of the kind of person my mother was. And so if I, if I know that a woman is a lawyer or a doctor or something like that, and I have no qualms at all about going to them for help. Uh, it's not an issue for me that they can do it. They can do it. Always remember who I am. I remember where I came from. I remember the things that I had to put up with as I was growing up. Uh, I hopefully taught my children uh, not to be like that, to judge people on who they are and how they behave. And when I say that, you know, their conduct overall. Uh, do they keep their word, uh, you know, when they do their job, do they do their job properly and not try to be slackers or things like that. And, and uh, so I, I taught them that. But my culture is uh, almost a, a, a daily thing because of the, of the foods that I eat. My mother was a fantastic cook, is a fantastic cook. And out of all six children, my two sisters never learned how. I learned how to cook. I, I love to cook and her dishes are authentic Mexican dishes that she learned from her mother in Mexico. And, and I mean, and I love the food, so uh, how do you do it? And so I learned all the little, you know, the ingredients and how to do it right and everything. Uh, I taught my wife how to make tortillas. She makes fresh homemade tortillas. and uh, So it's, it's almost a daily thing uh, that I have uh, in, in, in my culture uh, that I try to keep there. I'm, I'm very proud of my culture. Uh, just to, and because of my background being in the military for so many years, I did a lot of research uh, percentage-wise now, not numbers, but percentage-wise. Uh, Hispanics have more Congressional Medal of Honors than any other group. Uh, white, black, Asian, whatever. Uh, more uh, Hispanics have uh, given their lives in defense of their country because they, I mean, we've talked to some of the guys that survived from World War II, Korea, and so forth, because they're trying to prove that, hey, we belong in, in this country. And so I'm very proud of that. One of the things that uh that I really, really learned in the San Luis Valley, especially from my uncle that I told you about earlier, is the work ethic. In those days, the biggest compliment that you could pay anybody was, you're a good worker. And whenever people talked about another person, if they ever said, he's a good worker or she's a good worker, that was a huge compliment. And the words in Spanish were, Muy buen trabajador o muy mojerota. Everybody worked together. Uh, building a house, uh, it was everybody together. Education was important uh, to my family, but so was working. You know, you had to work to make a living. Um, myself personally, I, I got an associate's degree in communications. I was in the Marine Corps. Uh, bridged over about 11 years total between my active and inactive service, uh, inactive reserve service. And, um, but th those were my, my tools, you know, um, my experiences that I picked up from my parents, my grandparents. Uh, military was a big impact on my life. Um, that, was, that was something that taught me, you know, a lot of leadership. And you know, the Marine Corps does teach you leadership, definite teaches you how to take care of each other, teaches you a sense of not only compassion but protecting our country for the good that it is, something that we don't acknowledge enough of. Yeah, we grew up in a place that still today is very beautiful and it was very beautiful then. Um, you know, we grew up in a place uh, called Los Rincones, which was one of those first settlements that was uh, actually the first uh, people who went into Los Rincones and, and farmed there, farmed there in 1848. 
And so we still live in, on that same farm. My family still lives on that same farm. My grandmother uh, was born on May 15th of 1884 in the same room that my father was born in on March 10th, 1916. And so I know that area very well. And my memories of growing up is that we were working very hard. Uh, we were a, a poor family. Uh, we didn't have uh, telephone and we didn't have uh, electrical power out at our uh, place through the power lines until 1981. And so as we were growing up, uh, you know, my father and mother did the very best they could. Uh, we had about uh, 70 sheep, as I recall, and uh, probably 10, 20 head of cows. And, We'd grow potatoes, but it was tough uh, making a living for eight kids uh, under those circumstances. And my memories of uh, growing up in uh, the valley and, and on our ranch is that uh, we were always working. Uh, some some days, uh, even on uh, uh, holidays like Thanksgiving, we would be out gathering wood uh, uh, by the river, uh, getting ready for the winter instead of uh, doing a family celebration with a with a turkey or with a lamb. Yeah, I remember as well uh, spending a lot of time on a horse, um, tending to cattle and putting sheep in pens and doing uh, the kinds of things that you would do as, as, as a farmer. And I also perhaps most fondly remember uh, my mother and my father whose pictures adorn the walls today of the Attorney General's office and, and their teachings, uh, coming home and having them, having all of our uh, family sitting around the table doing their homework. and. Uh, my father and mother telling us that uh, they were poor, but that they wanted us to have opportunities that they had never had. And so they made sure we got an education. All eight of us graduated from high school, and all eight of us became first generation college graduates. So I have a lot of great memories of the valley, and my values uh, truly are rooted in, in the soils of the, of the valley. My mother was born in Santa Fe. My father was born in Springer, New Mexico. And of course, my mother, uh, after moving to Colorado Springs, she used to tell us stories about the Spanish and the Anglos. And a lot of times people would say, why don't you go back where you came from? Because of the, our names. And she would come out and say, we were here first. We were here long before any of you ever came to this country. I think it's important for me right now to just be caring and attentive to my values of the Latin culture and not necessarily be Puerto Rican or Mexican or Equatorian or whatever. I mean, I'm just a Latina woman that loves salsa and enjoys our food and, uh, and wants to make a difference in, in our I, uh, in our area of Colorado Springs. What cultural term do you use to describe yourself? A Latina woman. I, I, I like the term Chicana and because that term to me indicates a reclaiming of one's history and understanding um, and acknowledgement of the history good, romanticized, um, bad, challenging, uh, all aspects of, of one's background and the background of one's family, acknowledging the mixture of, of cultures because there's certainly, I have, I have an American Indian background, but that's layered and intertwined with so many other different kinds of, of backgrounds that it's hard to be distinct and I think that Chicana is the word that it, it also talks about a movement in the 60s and and so it's the word that I feel comfortable with although it's not always the right setting to use it. Uh, given the fact that we have so many Hispanic as far as cultures you know you have your Spanish, Mexican, Cuban, Puerto Rican, Philippine I like to be called Hispanic primarily because it's not so politically, politically incorrect. It takes all of us in. And we are, we are a smaller world today than we were when I was growing up. I like to be preferred to as a Hispanic. I don't know about Bernie. Well, same, I feel the same way as Natalie. 
except when we do some things in uh, the Hispanic Arts Council, we add the Latino. So that doesn't leave out the people who feel that they should be calling us Latinas or Latinos. Over the years, you know, it's, it's always been for us a challenge because as mestizos, um, we are a mixture. You know, when the Spanish conquered, I mean, they stopped in a lot of places, didn't they? Um, and in one form or another, um, when the word Hispanic really came about, that began to hit me a little, a little easy. Of course, Latino, Latino, okay, well, Latino what? I never heard Latino around these parts. Of course, you heard them out in the East Coast, or maybe somewhat to an extent, maybe in the West Coast, I don't know. But, um, you know, it did cover a wide range. And it took till I got a little older to clearly understand uh, and appreciate that identity of many others, the Cubanos, the Puerto Ricanos, you know, the uh, Colombianos, uh, you know, gente de Honduras, you know, things like that. Well, wow, I started thinking, well, then who am I? Well, Colombianos, well, they're from Colombia. They got a country. Los Mexicanos vienen de México. Ellos también tienen su país. You go to Puerto Rico. Well, yeah, they got their they got their place too. But who am I? And I uh, say to myself, well, geez, I'm from here. I was born here. We can track our lineages all the way back to Spain. And yet, who am I? I'm not really a Mexican. I'm a pocho, according to the Mexicans. Okay. Well, I'm not really from Spain because I was born here, but I got lineages of Spain. And all the gringos think I'm a foreigner. And what are you doing speaking a foreign language in my country? Okay. <laughs> Then who am I? Well, the way we've embraced ourselves today, in a nutshell, we have a comfort level. I, more specific, have a comfort level of calling myself a Hispanic. Sal Trujillo used to be the uh, president of uh, US West and now runs the largest uh, cell phone company in all of Europe. It's uh, larger than Verizon. And I remember him, I remember uh, Sal at a, um, speech that he once gave in Denver maybe five or six years ago looking out at a very large and, and a very diverse crowd, uh, Anglos and women and uh, minorities and others. And he looked out and he said, I feel in my heart orgullo, uh, which means pride. Uh, he had uh, a lot of pride as a CEO of one of the largest co co Colorado's largest companies to look out and to see the diversity that was there and to say that he was very proud of that and he was very proud of who he was. In the same way for me, uh, you know, when I think about our history and our heritage, uh, I think about Uruguayo, uh, pride, because I'm very proud of that history and I'm very proud of that heritage. I also think it's um, very important for all people uh, to be proud and to know their heritage and uh, I join with the Irish Americans and with German Americans and the celebration of Oktoberfest and uh, all people because um, in the end what makes uh, this country a great country and what will make this country an even greater country is when we really understand the fact uh, that we are out of many parts one country and when you see the motto on the back of our coins it says a pluribus unum uh, out of many one, that really is uh, a principal value of mine.